Hi there, friend. My name is John Werner. I used to be a part of the largest cult in the United States. After studying the Bible, Christian history, and ministry, I set my sights on confronting the problematic nature of white evangelicalism in the United States. In 2019, I published my first book as a first step in addressing the subtle issues of this complex system. This podcast will continue that work under the same title. Welcome to The Cult of Christianity. Well, it is a great honor for me to have um, someone I'm a little starstruck by on today's show. Uh, He ran for president this past election. He wrote one of my favorite books, Unsettling Truths, The Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery. Uh, A personal hero of mine, and it truly is amazing um, that this is happening right now, and I'm so grateful. Uh, Mark, would you mind introducing yourself? Well, thank you, John. It's great to be with you. Yes, please let me introduce myself. Yate, Mark Charles Yenishia, Sin Bekedene Anishle, Do Tohiblini Bashichin, Sin Bekedene Dashiche, Do Todachitni Dashinella. In our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're matrilineal as a people, and our identities come from our mother's mother. So my mother's mother is, a, is American of Dutch heritage, and that's why I say Sin Bekedene. Loosely translated, that means I'm from the Wooden Shoe people. My second, uh, my, my second clan, my father's mother, is Toihiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsin And then my fourth clan, my father's father, is Todachitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. I also just want to acknowledge I'm speaking to you today from what's known as Washington, D.C., I moved here with my family about six years ago from the Navajo Nation, and this area is the traditional lands of the Piscataway. The Piscataway are the nation that they've lived here, they've hunted here, they farmed here and fished here. They were here long before Columbus got lost at sea, and they are still here. I've had the honor of meeting some of the Piscataway. I've been welcomed to these lands by some of the Piscataway, and I want to just publicly state how humbled I am to be living on these lands, and I want to thank them for their stewardship of these lands. Thank you, Mark. Uh, You are truly an inspiration, not only in your um, writing, but in different talks you've given and different uh, podcasts you've been on. Um, Having read your book, I I feel like I know a bit of your background, but I'm curious specifically about the first maybe 18 years of your life. Um, Did you grow up in the church? Yes, I did. I grew up, um, my, my grandparents worked as translators for, um, some of the early missionaries that came to the Navajo Nation, um, even with the Christian Reformed Church. And my mother, so my, my grandparents were working as translators. My grandfather helped, uh, translate some of the, the Bible into Navajo as well as uh, some of the songs into Navajo. And my grandmother, uh, both my grandparents were boarding school survivors. Um, and so they were, my grandmother was converted to Christianity in the boarding schools and helped, uh, start one of the earlier churches on our reservation. Um, and they were living at, uh, a, a mission compound by this Christian Reformed church, uh, called Rehoboth, just outside of Gallup, New Mexico. And my grandfather was working for the missionaries there. And my father had just gone out of the Marines and uh, was doing some work around the school. And my mother had, was on her way to Africa to be a missionary nurse. And she came for some training at Rehoboth. And she was supposed to be there for a, a year or two, I think. And she met my father. They began dating. And eventually they got married. And she never left. So she worked as a nurse um, in, in that hospital uh, for her entire career. And so I was born there. <clears throat> I attended Rehoboth Christian School, um, grew up in the Christian Reformed Church. And the way I best described it to people is, right, well, I grew up living on this mission compound that started literally as a boarding school. And it was staffed and and su- uh, supported, funded mostly by the CRC Church, by Dutch American Christians. And yet it was a ministry to the Navajo people. My grandparents lived on campus. I had other relatives who lived on campus. 
and it's in a, board, a checkerboard area of the Navajo Nation, so there's a lot of reservation lands right around there. And I describe it as I grew up in a Dutch ghetto just off of the Navajo Nation. And that was very much my experience growing up. Um, you know, so I had my Navajo grandparents right there. Um, I had the whole Dutch culture. Um, and of course, living in the United States, all of the American culture that came from living in New Mexico. And that was my growing up. You know, I, I, it was a Christian school. I grew up in the church. I became a Christian at a very young age. Uh, but it really wasn't until I got to college where I began to kind of take some ownership of my own faith. So you're saying that you uh, took more ownership of your faith in college. Is that the time that you decided to go into ministry or was it a little earlier than that? Actually, it was, it was after that. I, um, when I got to college, I attended college at UCLA in Los Angeles. Um, and I went in as a pre-econ major. I took two, one econ class and I hated it. <laughs> so I dropped that major and really kind of floated for about a year and a half, wasn't sure what I wanted to study and ended up deciding on history um, because I liked the way it gave me, um, it challenged me to think critically about what I was reading and, and this also to be able to interpret it. But it really wasn't until um, near the end of my college career where I decided I wanted to do something ministry related. And my first job out of college was I actually worked with a native uh, student fellowship at the University of New Mexico called Southwest Campus Christian Fellowship. And so I began kind of doing some part-time ministry there. And uh, eventually it it kind of changed and morphed over the years after that. But uh, yeah, that it wasn't until the end of my college career that I decided I wanted to go to do more ministry type work. Gotcha. And then the only like just clarifying decision point I was kind of curious about, um, you ran for president as an independent and surely you knew that was quite a daunting task. Um, and like I mentioned to you earlier, you're one of the names I actually wrote in. Um, but I also knew the way write-ins work. It probably wouldn't be counted. But let's just play the hypothetical game. You, If you were to win, what do you think um, would have been like one of the big changes right off the bat if you had uh, actually won the presidency? Yeah, well, the whole point of my campaign was I wanted to address the systemic racism, sexism and white supremacy within our foundations. Um, Whether it's my TEDx talk that I gave, We the People, the Three Most uh, Misunderstood Words in U.S. History, or whether it's my book on Selling Truths are the lectures I give on the doctrine of discovery. One of the things I advocate for um, that I'm convinced we need as a nation is that we need a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. It's a conversation I would put on par with the truth and the reconciliation commissions that happened in South Africa, in Rwanda, and in Canada. And so my goal was to bring that, that was a primary plank of my platform. One of the other primary planks of my platform was I wanted to remove the racism, the sexism and the white supremacy from our foundations. So Joe Biden had a 100 day plan for his first 100 days in office to get 100 shots of COVID vaccine into people's arms here in the US. I had a 100 day plan to remove the racism, the sexism and the white supremacy from our foundations um, and actually to address it at a constitutional foundational level and remove it, doing things such as actually abolishing slavery, which would mean taking the clause out of the 13th Amendment that keeps slavery legal in prison. It would mean removing and and actually, I actually called for an editing of the Constitution. You know, it's great that we have amendments, but an amendment is kind of like a footnote, right? It comes at the end of it. So you have to read through this racist and sexist document. And at the end, it tells you when we said this, we should have meant that. I said, you know what, this is our document. Rather than amending it, we should edit it. And my logic was, right, there's not a single corporation in the world today running off of bylaws written in the 1700s. And yet we're still running our country off of bylaws written in the 1700s in the racist and sexist and white supremacist language of the 1700s. And so I wanted to remove those. And I felt fairly convinced we could. I felt like, you know, once we were able to get a national platform and address this at a national level and even at a global level, 
I felt like there would be enough public shame as well as motivation to say, yeah, we have to change some of this language so we actually can be the nation we claim we want to be. It's certainly a world that uh, I would like to move towards. Um, And I uh, frankly feel like even if we are heading that direction, it is at a snail's pace. And uh, one of the reasons I uh, was so glad you ran um, was because uh, I wanted the pace to quicken. Um, You mentioned earlier talking about the doctrine of discovery. Do you mind giving kind of a broad definition of what that is? Yeah, the Doctrine of Discovery, it's a series of papal bulls, edicts of the Catholic Church. They say things like invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever. Reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, convert them to his and to their use and profit. It's essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are subhuman and their land is yours to take. So this is literally the doctrine that let European nations go into Africa, colonize the continent and enslave the people because they didn't believe them to be human. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was lost at sea, land in this new world, which was already inhabited by millions and claimed to have discovered it. The first sentence of the first chapter of our book says you cannot discover lands already inhabited, right? You can steal those lands, you can conquer them, you can even colonize them, but you cannot discover them unless your worldview, your your implicit bias tells you that the people who are already living there are not human. So the doctrine of discovery is a white supremacist, racist doctrine. And it actually is the fruit of the church that I would say has prostituted itself out to empire. I just, um, I, I preached a sermon numerous times called How We Got from the Teachings of Jesus, who said things like, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, how we got from that to a dehumanizing doctrine of discovery that said the church can kill people who doesn't speak like, worship like, eat like, or act like. The majority does. And the way that the church got there is a fascinating journey, and it's rooted in not only racism, sexism, and white supremacy, but it's rooted in what I would call a desire for prosperity rather than a desire of of losing your life, right? So if Christ called people to, to lose their life, and the world calls you to save your life, the church, I would argue, right around the time Constantine came, became emperor, decided it didn't want to be persecuted anymore. It wanted to now save to protect its life. It wanted to prosper instead of being persecuted. And so it realigned itself, and that that's what set it on the trajectory to writing a doctrine of discovery and then using that doctrine to justify unheard of violence against marginalized people. It's pretty interesting you bring up, um, well, you brought up a lot there. (laughs) Um, You brought up Constantine, you brought up, um, you know, different councils and stuff. Is this whiteness or white supremacy, um, is it unbreakably linked to Christianity or is it just kind of happenstance that it's uh, connected to Christianity? Well, so, (laughs) I mean, this is, this is the, the, the really tough question because, the book we when I first began to write this book with my co-author uh, Sung Chan Ra. If you have not read anything by Sung Chan Ra, I highly recommend his books. He has another book called The Next Evangelicalism, and just before the book we wrote together, he wrote a book called A Prophetic Lament. And uh, Sung Chan is a he's a, a professor of theology at North Park Seminary. He's actually moving to Fuller Seminary in Southern California this next year, and he and I have become great friends. And he has a very strong and prophetic voice. And I was so grateful that he co-authored this book with me. Um, But when we started out to write this book, the book initially was a call for the church to lament. We were trying to point out the, the, the missteps the church had taken over the past several centuries, actually a few thousand years. And we were calling the church through a process of lament to come back to the teachings of Jesus. 
However, we signed our contract to write the book. I think it was in um, 2015, if I remember correctly. And didn't start writing it until 2017. And I remember after the election of Donald Trump and the undeniable proof how his election was in large part due to the support both financially and the vote of white evangelicals, um, that we decided we had to change the whole thesis of our book instead of being a call to lament to instead just being a flat out rebuke of the church. And so the book literally concludes that in its current state, in the state of the church as it is in the America in America today, it is incapable of being a part of the solution to the problems that it's caused. And I would argue that's not first and foremost because of its whiteness. It's first and foremost because of its acceptance of the heresy of Christendom or Christian empire. The belief that the church was meant to be a worldly empire here on this earth. And that is what led to its becoming embedded with power, which led to the protecting of that power through white supremacy and through racism and through sexism. Um, you know, a lot of people will say, well, um, uh, slavery was the first, the original sin of the United States of America. And I actually have a, a very, I challenge people theologically about that. It is, it is incorrect to say slavery is America's original sin, first of all. And, and one of the reasons why that's a dangerous statement, and yet Christians make it all the time, is because when you say slavery is a sin or the nation has committed a sin, you are holding the nation to account based not on a common acceptance of morality, but based on a theological definition of right or wrong by a specific religion. Where the U.S. got it wrong is because it believed it was a Christian empire, because it believed that this was promised lands meant for the church of, of Western Europeans, it allowed it to justify genocide. And so if there was a sin, an original sin, it wasn't of the nation, it was of the church. And it was the, the, the sin of the church believing it could be an empire here on earth, which led to those other things. And so whether it's Joe Biden or others who say America's original sin, you know, uh, Joe Biden has said that, uh, uh, Jim Wallace has said that, other people have said that. No, that by calling it our original sin is actually perpetuating the problem because it's saying our nation should be Christian. Yes, slavery was injustice. It was not the original injustice. The original injustice, I would say, is the church, the nation, believing it was in bed with the church. Yeah, and also uh, it kind of neglects the whole native genocide thing. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. What... And this is where, you know, where I, one of the things that I work very hard to do is we so often treat our history in silos. So for most of the nation, the definition of racism is slavery. And while I do not disagree that slavery was a horrible injustice and needs to be addressed, it's not the only injustice, nor is it the root of the injustice. We also have the incredible genocide of Native peoples. But that also is not to be dealt in a silo. That what's beneath both of those two is the doctrine of discovery, the heresy of Christian empire, and how that's rooted in both American exceptionalism and white supremacy. That's so well put, and I think it really frames the conversation in a much more um, material or tangible sense rather than ideals. I think a lot of this conversation gets muddied when you try to idealize the world too much. And, um, you know, there's an argument I remember uh, gr hearing growing up. Um, and I, I think it was more popular when I was a kid and is becoming less popular. But um, 
the the argument kind of goes that even talking about race is problematic so like since we're all one human race is it even helpful to talk about race at all i think we have to talk about it because it's the way the united states has set up its foundations and the way it frames itself and the way it it it, it judges who's going to receive what services and who's going to get what benefit and so on and so forth is it the best way to do it? No, <laughs> but it's it's how this nation was established. And so, right, this is the problem, is we have politicians, and I'll actually use examples from the, from the left, right? So in his last State of the Union, President Obama was acknowledging the division, the racism he had experienced while he was in office for eight years. And he was calling the nation to what he said was a new politic. And he quoted the Constitution. He said, we the people, our Constitution begins with these three simple words. Words we've come to recognize mean all the people. That sounded beautiful. And he got a lot of applause for that line. But I listened to him and I said, when? When did we decide that we the people meant all the people? Right? That, that just wishing it was so does not address the way that we the people has been very explicitly defined by our foundation as white landowning men and we've never corrected those things and so oftentimes the people who say let's not talk about race they're they're trying to lessen the divisiveness or the conflict but if we don't acknowledge what our foundations actually say, we're never going to be able to fix them. And I, I get on Joe, President Biden for this all the time as well. He loves to misquote the Declaration of Independence. And he says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. That's a beautiful thought, Mr. President. That's not what our foundations say. Our foundations say we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And then 13 line or 50 several lines later, 30 lines later, it refers to natives as savages. So not only does it exclude women, it counts natives as less than human. If we can't acknowledge that's what it says, we're never going to be able to fix it moving forward. I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's where like the conversation, like I think the conversation purposely gets um, muddied by, you know, stereotypically like um, uh, white landowning men because, uh, you know, they don't want to address the things that need that would be a threat to their power. Um, and so you can kind of idealize away um, what's actually happened <laughs> um, and, it, and, it, and what is actually written down. Um, so kind of tying some of this back to like Christianity, do you think that religion in general or specifically Christianity does bring more harmony or does it bring more um, divisiveness when it comes to uh, racial divides? I think the trajectory of the Christian faith is about including everybody. I do not think the practice of the Christian faith has reached that point yet. And that, I think, is is a very significant problem that we have. I, I just preached a sermon yesterday in the church. Um, it was virtual, but it was a church in New York City. And yesterday was, our, our this past week was Pentecost Sunday. And um, in my sermon, I was addressing what I would say were Jesus' apparent ethnocentric views. Right? When he dealt with Gentiles, he was at best passive-aggressive and at worst outright dismissive. He was not very inclusive of Gentiles in his ministry. And yet the church will point to Jesus all the time and say, Jesus loved everybody. Well, he called a Canaanite woman a dog. He passive-aggressively took a a swipe at a centurion who had great faith. And he refused to allow a Gentile who was a demoniac to follow him. Again, these are not the typical stories you think of when you think of Jesus, right? That's not the narrative we've been given. Jesus came with a very specific purpose, which was to fulfill the Old Testament law and to offer his body as a sacrifice. 
Now, people love to say, well, Jesus loved everybody. Well, the Old Testament law didn't allow him to love everybody. The Old Testament law required that he remain separate from Gentiles. The Old Testament required that he refused to eat with them or include them or even to, to be in, in deep relationship with them. And he kept, he, but he had to keep that law perfectly. And so he did that. It's then the Holy Spirit that we see, not even in Acts 2, because when everyone, when the Holy Spirit comes in Acts 2 and we have this Acts 2 community, all the people who convert are all Jews. Yes, they're from all over the world, but they all have converted to Judaism beforehand. They all, all the men were circumcised. Everyone went to synagogue. They all kept kosher. They all followed the laws of cleanliness. They all were culturally Jewish. They all worshiped in Hebrew. It's not until Acts 10 where the the Holy Spirit shows this vision to Peter, right? And this is compelling because Peter sees this vision of a blanket with all these animals, including unclean animals on them. And Peter says, and he's told to kill them and eat them. And Peter says, never. I have never eaten anything unclean. Now in Mark 7, Jesus declares all foods clean. Peter was with Jesus' ministry from the very beginning. So even though Jesus declared all foods clean, apparently they never ate any unclean foods because Peter is definitively saying in Acts 10, he's never let those foods touch his mouth. It's it's interesting when you, because my brain's going, like being trained in a very um, white evangelical school that I was, um, these are all very great points, but but then it's also like the the typical response you would get to some of this would be, yeah, but think of all the the um, uh, cultural taboos Jesus did do. Think of all the the uh, outcast women and such that he did talk to. Yeah, he was radically inclusive of anyone remotely associated with Judaism, including <laughs> right. Samaritans. He was very dismissive and outright exclusive of Gentiles. Gotcha, and that's where that ethnocentrism. Um, and that's where, again, that's yeah. what the law required him to do. And he kept the law perfectly. That's interesting. I honestly have not given that particular point that much thought. Well, even if you just to take it one step further, even if you look down in Acts 10, after he goes to Cornelius's house and he preaches and he sees the spirit fall on Gentiles and he says, what's to prevent me from baptizing you? It says, then the circumcised believers who were with Peter were astonished that the Spirit of God fell even on the Gentiles. When the apostles hear it in chapter 11, and Peter tells them the story, it says, so then even Gentiles are included, right? These are people who spent their entire ministries with Jesus, and they had no clue that Gentiles were supposed to be included. Why? Because Jesus' job wasn't to include the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit picks that up. And it's the Holy Spirit after Jesus dies, after he becomes this blameless sacrifice. Now, this faith can be opened up to everybody. But Jesus, that was not his role. And so when, we, when the church places an emphasis on Jesus loved everybody, what they then do is they allow themselves to be dismissive or even ignore the working of the Holy Spirit today. And so when we can be honest and say Jesus wasn't inclusive, the Holy Spirit is what included everybody, then what that means is we today need to be very attentive to the Holy Spirit today so that we can actually build this church that can be inclusive of everybody. Man, that's so wrapped up in Trinitarian theology. And I'm like, wow, I would love to just go down that rabbit hole. But I actually do want to <laughs> shift the conversation a little differently. Um, thank you for getting into that. That actually gives me a lot to think about. Um, I So like I, the one theory I put forth in my book when it comes to like some of the um, uh, racial divides that exist in the U.S., um, I, I as because they they're still happening, right? Like we've talked a lot about the history, but like if you look at any study, you know, um, 
90 percent about uh churches are still segregated based on race um and uh it seems at some point to be intentional and not accidental um and i personally believe that these you know i call white evangelical pastors typically i just call them cult leaders because that is how i see them um and i i tend to think that they want their um to be divisions among races and and other superficial variables in order to control people easier you know the more monolithic a group the easier it is to manipulate them is my distrust in those leaders like too simple or too accusatory so one of the things that i i um i've been kind of really ad- reflecting on and trying to address even in the past few weeks is I have grown increasingly frustrated with the church. And one of the reasons I feel frustrated with the church is because in my mind and from what I've read of the scriptures, the church should be a place of refuge, of refuge, right? If the world's going to beat you down, if the world's going to hurt you, if the world's going to oppress you, if the world's going to dehumanize you, the church should be the place where your humanity is affirmed. The church should be the place where where you can seek refuge, be strengthened, be lifted up. And the problem is, is the church cannot even agree on the humanity of its neighbors. And so, this means when you go into church, when I go into church, and if I'm a Gentile to the Jews and I'm a savage to Western Christianity, and, and you know, my, my humanity of myself or of other people are just being beaten down by the world, you want to go to church and have your humanity reaffirmed. But the church is actually the place where you have to defend your humanity the hardest and the strongest. And that feels really frustrating. Like one of the things I said throughout my campaign, because what was most, one of the most beautiful aspects of my political campaign in 2020 was when you run a campaign and your, your phrase, your, your motto of your campaign is to build a nation where we, the people truly means all the people, your support volunteers, money, votes, your support literally comes from all the people. And we had one of the most diverse support teams, ethnically, racially, gender, sexual orientation. We had one of the most diverse teams I've ever been a part of in all of my years of working in the church. And it was fat, and we were all working towards this goal, right, of acknowledging the humanity of everybody. And I, I kept saying, "There's, there's a sermon, if not even a flat-out rebuke, in this at some point for the church, of seeing this diversity that's seeking to affirm life, and it's happening. This team is being built not in the church, but in this more secular space, and." I think that's a rebuke to the church. I think that's something where the church needs to realize, yeah, until the church can agree on the humanity of its neighbors, regardless of their religion, regardless of their socioeconomic background, regardless of their race, the color of their skin, or the ethnic heritage, until the church, or their sexual, sexual orientation, until the church can agree on the humanity of its neighbors, it has no hope of being a part of the solution to the problems our world is facing today. That That is just such a crystallized way of what I've said on uh, other podcasts and what uh, interviews and stuff as to why I left the faith. When I realized, um, well, in my life, like I, I had a pretty... Um, a just unfortunate year where everything kind of dominoed and... I ended up pretty much functionally homeless um, and divorced and broke and lived in a bar. Um, 
And when I realized that the bar was a better support system than any church I've ever been a part of, and when I realized that um, I was a better person when I stopped going to church, like that was the maybe the most haunting fact for me, uh, was I'm like, not only do I feel like I'm around better people when I'm not in church, I feel like my I'm becoming a better person when I'm not in church. And I think that really solidified why I left. Um, and that that the way you um, just put that as this, like, it was a failure to recognize the humanity of everyone. And it and it's very real. The humanity of my friends, the humanity of me at points, um, the humanity of my ex-wife, um, the humanity of a bunch of different um, people I cared about deeply. It seemed they were more accepted in the secular world than ever were in church. And it, and it truly is upsetting, especially when you have such a deep connection and love uh, for that faith that's so ingrained in you. Um, it was not easy to walk away, but it felt like I almost had to. Yeah. That one of the most popular tweets on my, on my Twitter account this last month was when I said, one of the primary reasons the church is failing at the command to love your neighbors yourself is because it refuses to acknowledge the humanity of most of its neighbors. Exactly. Yeah. I think, you know, there, there's a, there is a growing, number of people who are feeling marginalized by the church, the institution of the church. And even to be, I mean, to be honest, my prayer over the past, my, my entire ministry life has, my goal has been, I want to encourage the church. That's been my vision for maybe the past 20, 25 years of my life, maybe even longer. And in the past few months, I find myself increasingly in prayer, not for the church, but for the remnant. Because God always saves a remnant. And I found myself more and more frequently praying, God, strengthen your remnant. And the remnant are people who many of them have left the church. There are people who are like, no, this can't be what God is. This can't be who God is. This can't be how we're supposed to live this out. There has to be something else here. And so they've left that oppressive institution. And they said, I, there has, they haven't given up seeking life, seeking truth, but they've found disillusionment in the institution of the church. And I believe a lot of those people are what I would call the remnant. And I have a huge desire to see that remnant be encouraged and to, to see the, the institution, the oppressive, dehumanizing, white supremacist, racist, and sexist institution that I know as Western Christianity to actually be known for the fruit that it's producing which is wretched yeah it is and 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 on the institutional level i mean we know on an individual level right that we all have um confirmation biases and we all have you know perpetuate just ideas that were passed down to us um we know that happens on an individual level so it likely also happens on an institutional level so i'm wondering if it is possible for an institution as large as a country to face its own prejudice. Is that actually possible? At the moment, I actually have greater hope that the country will address its racist, sexist, and white supremacist foundations than the church will address its racism, sexism, and white supremacy. What a, what a commentary. I mean, it's, um, what a, what a, uh, flip of the script so to speak because it, it, it's practically speaking churches are not as regulated as a country is you would think it would be easier for them to face their prejudice right something something in the work i'm doing because I've, I've had this vision of this national dialogue on race gender and class i've had this vision of addressing these things at a foundational level for at least 10 to 15 years and i spent a good two-thirds to three-fourths of that time 
raising these issues within the church. Right. I was on the, the board of trustees for the Christian Reformed Church. I, I lecture at Calvin Seminary and other Christian churches all over the country, Christian universities and seminaries. I've, I've written articles. I've, I've published books. I've, I've done things to engage the church. And over the past 10 to 15 years, the answer, the pushback I continually get from the institutional church has helped me to identify that that institution is not a partner in this work, but a block to it. And so even when I, when I ran my campaign, and I'm looking, right, for partners and for people to support me, I did not look primarily to the church because I knew at an institutional level, the church is actually deeply opposed to making these changes and addressing these problems. Which almost speaks to how much power they must have, right? Because like typically like when things are, I don't know, the, the I mean, if someone's really defensive or institutions get very defensive, it's because they're protecting their power. Um, and why, and, and it just goes back to pretty much everything we're talking about that, um, when, uh, there's this pushback to the church or whatever, and they, and they don't want to, um, they don't want to engage the topic. It's because recognizing the humanity of people somehow threatens the church's power. And that scares me. (laughs) Like that sounds so problematic to me. Oh, it is. It's very problematic. And this is this is right. This is why I tweeted that a, a couple of weeks ago. This is why our book is a flat out rebuke of the church. We are I'm literally coming to the conclusion that, yeah, the church needs realignment before it can become a helpful participant in this work. Now, I'm not I'm not dismissing all Christians. I'm not dismissing everyone within the church, sure. but the institution of the church is not capable of of being a part of the solution and and many levels at least in the work i've been trying to engage has been a direct opponent of this work we're trying to do yeah and i hope any christians listening know this is not a personal attack on your faith Like, I I think there's, it's very purposeful sometimes that white evangelicals make um, or encourage their congregation to think any criticism of a, of church is somehow a personal attack on an individual's faith. And they're two completely different things. Yeah. Um, One of the things you mentioned in your book that I think you put very well is um, how the victors of war get to control historical narratives to some extent. And the U.S. has won more wars than anyone in recent history, at least. And, um, you know, so obviously the U.S. gets to control the narrative to some extent. Um, On the other hand, there are many more different perspectives on historical events and occurrences um, here in the U.S. than in uh, the education systems of some other countries or just in the general culture. Uh, Just kind of I I like how you... um, Uh, reference a lot of historical facts in your book and personally i actually do not enjoy studying history sometimes because i like narratives i don't like facts (laughs) like a a list of dates is a surefire way to put me to sleep um so what is your uh, method or what do you think is a good measure for trusting a historical source so one of the things that I worked the hardest to do, and I, I do this throughout our book, I do this in my lectures, is I try to avoid quoting experts on topics. Um, not that I don't read them, I don't get, I understand what they're saying, whether it's historians or theologians or whatever, but rarely will I reference them um, or quote them. And I like, so if you read my book, one of two one of the most disruptive sections of the book is uh, where we deconstruct the legacy of Abraham Lincoln, right? And Abraham Lincoln has become a mythological figure in U.S. history. He's our greatest president, blah, blah, blah. Yet he was actually, if you read his writings and look at his policies, not only was he one of the most white supremacist presidents in U.S. history, 
but he was one of the most genocidal, which is completely contrary to the narrative, the mythology that we've constructed for him. Now, when I was building that argument, I could have quoted different experts on Lincoln. However, as I've learned over the past several decades, if I take that more academic route, I will have a great academic debate going about different schools of thought and who's what, you know, this and that and everything else. What I did instead is I quoted Lincoln. I put up his quotes from the Lincoln-Douglas debates. I put up his signature on policies that he signed. I put up actions by his armies that he was commanding and what they did. And I, in a sense, challenged our readers to deal with his actual words. So when you read that Abraham Lincoln literally stated I have no intention of making voters or jurors or Negroes or allowing them to hold office or to intermarry. When he says there's a, a physical difference between the white and black race, which he believes will, will forever forbid the two from living in terms of social and political um, equality. But as long as they have to be together, there must be the position of inferior and superior. And I, said Abraham Lincoln, as well as any other man, believe in the superior position of the white race. Right? Deal with that. <laughs> and, and, and so I found that by by quoting these more source documents and by bringing this history to light and making people wrestle with that it allows us to deal with the issue instead of dealing with all of the academics around the issue um and so i i i did very similar things with you know there's a very strong critique in chapter 3 and 4 about the birth of christendom and I actually quote Eusebius, who wrote um, an ecclesiastical history. And I, I demonstrate by quoting his book how he writes Christ out of ecclesiastical history and inserts Constantine. And I say, so, I, and again, I could have quoted any number of theologians about Eusebius. I do the same thing with Augustine. I quote Augustine in Correction of the Donatists and in his Just War Theory and make people deal with that rather than quoting experts on Augustine. And so I do that to, to make people, I want people to wrestle with the issues, not about all the different schools of thoughts around the issues. I do the same thing when I watch debates on television, right? I, I listen, I watch the debate, and then I turn it off before the commentary. Because I don't want to be told what to think about what they said. I want to hear what they say. And then I want to process that for myself. Man, kudos for you to even be able to watch debates nowadays. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I have trouble even listening to uh, the, the just uh, dumbed down rhetoric. It gets pretty um, hard to stand sometimes. Um, I did want to, it's interesting you were talking about going directly to the source and, and you also tied in this idea of, um, you know, a mythology built around Lincoln, which I love those chapters. Unfortunately, like growing up in the South, I had heard a lot of those arguments, but unfortunately it was from the, the other end of the spectrum of white nationalism. So it was like, yeah, Lincoln was terrible. So slaves were fine. And that's not a great argument. Um, but uh, I'm glad that you bring that in there because, again, we need to deal with the facts and not the mythologies. I try to actually do the same thing in a lot of my work with Jesus. Like a lot of the time I'm quoting Jesus in order to explain where the church is going wrong, even though I don't even identify as a Christian anymore. And I think all people want to have a legacy. Like some people want whole mythologies around their names so that their legacy can outlive them. But some people want their legacy to be, you know, quaint and beloved by a small family or community. Um, and I think people gravitate towards figures or mythologies that they would like to imitate. And I think that's why Christianity, um, specifically white evangelicalism, is aggravating because the Christian cult doesn't seem too much like the God that they say they follow. Um, so how could white evangelicals redeem themselves and the current legacy that they're leaving behind? Well, this, for me, this is where I, this is one of the reasons we state in the book that in its current form, the church cannot be a part of the solution. 
And then when we do present a road forward, it goes directly through the process of lament, right? In his book, Prophetic Lament, Sung Chan Ra demonstrates beautifully how anemic Western Christianity, the church, is at lament. I like to point out that it's impossible to lament when you believe in your own exceptionalism, right? There's no space to lament. And so one of, the, one of my direct calls to the church is that if we want to engage with these issues, we have to go through, and I'm very clear, not through a service of lament, not through a period of lament. I call it we need to go through a season of lament. The reason I say this is because when the church does lament, it does for a very short time because it doesn't know how to sit in the brokenness, it doesn't know how to sit in the mess that it's created. When you read the scriptures, when the people of God lament, he always, he always shows up. He doesn't come quickly, but he does come. Because the American church does not stay in a place of lament very long, it's actually never engaged with God in lament. And so there's a whole side of God's character that the American church has basically never interacted with because it never stays in lament long enough for God to show up. And so I'm calling the church not to a service, not to a period, but to a season of lament. And the reason I'm, sp I'm, I'm intentionally using the word season is because it's creator who changes the seasons. And I want the church to stay in lament long enough so that it can actually interact with God there, because that is where the transformation is going to take place for the church to repent of its brokenness, repent of its sin, and actually have the paradigm shift that is necessary so it can become a productive and a useful tool in helping address these problems. Mark, I am elated that we had this time together. Um, I feel like I could talk to you for probably about eight more hours, but I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> so um, just one last chance to, you know, plug uh, yourself and also um, tell people any resources you want to give them uh, before we wrap up. Yeah. So um, my book on selling truths is uh for sale. And actually you can buy it pretty much anywhere online, but I'm on my own website, wirelesshogan.com. I'm selling signed copies of the book. So if you'd like to get a signed copy of the book, you can go to my website. I can actually give you the link too, and you can share that out. Um, I'm very active on social media. So I'm wireless Hogan most places. And I do a lot of things intentionally, especially with live streams um, on my Facebook and my YouTube channel, I, I like to live stream maybe three or four times a week. I'll go to the Potomac River right near my house and I'll watch the sunrise. And I actually have taken to streaming that and I invite people to come and join me to watch the sunrise. Um, as I identify in the book, that has probably been one of the most beneficial spiritual practices, disciplines of my entire life is when I was living on the reservation and for 11 years I rose every morning and greeted the morning sunrise with my prayers. And so now I'm doing that again here in DC and I'm inviting people to join me on my live streams. I also, a few times a week, I do what's called um, my second cup of coffee, where I sit down and just talk about issues in politics and in the church and in other things around the country, even the globe. And I give a perspective on it while I drink my second cup of coffee. I also just began a few weeks ago, another series I'm, I'm calling decolonizing faith, where I'm basically kind of sharing some of my journey of how I've been decolonizing my faith for the past 15 to 20 years. Teachings that I've, I've looked at, um, sermons that I've preached, uh, just the, the journey, the stories that I've accumulated and that I've been on as I've tried to decolonize my faith 
and really understand what does it mean to be native as well as to be a follower of Christ. Well, you are certainly a busy man, um, and uh, I can uh, definitely speak to the book. It is truly incredible. One of my favorite, um, I like that you book in uh, the book with this idea of watching a sunrise, and uh, it's truly just great writing objectively. And um, Mark, I don't want to just keep um, sucking up to you. So (laughs) uh, thank you so much for stopping by. Honestly, it's truly been um, one of the biggest honors of my life, and I don't say that lightly. Well, thank you, John. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I'm I'm grateful for the chance to have this conversation. And yeah, I'd be very excited to do a follow up at some point down the road if you ever want to talk some more. Oh, you know, I do. Uh, Thank you, listener, for tuning in. And I hope you all have a good one. If you wish to learn more about what's going on in my life, or wish to purchase my book, go to vernerbooks.com. If you'd like to support this podcast, please continue to listen, follow, share, and consider supporting through the link in the show's notes. For as little as 99 cents a month, you can help me book guests, upgrade my production value, and start exciting projects. Thank you for listening, and remember to keep love in your life, hope in your heart, and searching in your soul.